participants. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Todd Brown, who's going to start us off today uh, with some updates in the management of diabetes and people living with HIV. I think everyone knows Dr. Brown, but for anyone who doesn't, he is an absolute leader in the field of understanding the intersection between issues in endocrinology and, and people living with HIV, and um, it's just an incredible resource to have here at Hopkins for all of us. So thanks so much for doing this, Dr. Brown, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, uh, thanks, Eileen, for the introduction. So I'll be talking about diabetes um, and uh, focusing on, on management. So lots of things to think about when you're caring for people with HIV who are getting older in particular. And so my argument is why care about diabetes it seems obvious, but I think it's really important. We have a hugely uh, you know, a big pool of people with diabetes with increasing prevalence big cause of downstream outcomes, and you can see them here and you all know them. Common in people with HIV, some data, including in, in our the MAC study, that's more infected, more common in people with HIV versus people without. Um, and the important thing here is that the, it, we do have a lot of good medications to control diabetes, but it can be complicated, especially now that we have a lot of medications. It's difficult to know what to sequence and when, um, and it does require individualization. So it does take a lot of time to manage diabetes well. Um, so just a few words about pathogenesis. It's, it's pretty much the same in, the, in people with HIV versus not, um, where adiposity is the, the major driver of diabetes. Um, it's, it's interesting, this is a study from the, from the VA, which looked at the risk of diabetes um, in, with weight gain after antiretroviral initiation and the same period in people without uh, HIV. And as you would see, as you would imagine, the people without HIV, that as, you're, as the weight change increases with greater rate change, the risk of diabetes increases. But look at in the HIV positive on the right, what you see is that um, you do see the same relationship, but that slope that line that is actually greater than the people with HIV. So the amount of weight gain that you need to have in someone with HIV is actually smaller to have the same effect metabolically. So there is some suggestion that weight may be worse, adiposity may be worse in people with HIV, and there's a lot of speculation as to why that is. So lots of other different factors, um, HCV may play a role, um, genetic factors, of course, concomitant medications, atypical antipsychotics, corticosteroids are notorious. Um, any retroviral factors. So we know that, that um, exposure to drugs in the past and um, including thymidine analogs and older PIs can have legacy effects into the future. Um, and so that is a big driver of risk for people who've been, uh, been very treatment experienced. And whether um, medications um, uh, like integrase inhibitors that, that um, are associated with weight gain also lead to diabetes is, uh, is something that's being uh, investigated quite a bit. Then the other um, factors is important in, in um, for many different comorbidities, and that's the residual inflammation and immune activation, which may drive insulin resistance and, and decrease beta cell function in, in people with HIV. So let's jump into the on the clinic side of things, talking about um, how to screen. So this is a uh, um, and who to screen. So I, I put down. Um, so every January, the ADA comes out with revisions to its standard um, medical care and diabetes. So it's a great resource. Um, you can just Google, you know, diabetes standard. Um, and you, you get the it's a free document. So um, as of a couple of years ago, one of the screening guidelines, you know, to focus on people who are overweight uh, and obese, people with previous prediabetes, people with gestational, women with gestational diabetes, and then people with HIV should be included in sort of a special category. So there's a recognition um, as of a couple of years ago um, uh, that this is a particular population to target. So how do we um, uh, uh, make the diagnosis of diabetes? So there are really four ways. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the, so um, fasting glucose is probably the, the best way to go, most, most easiest way to go. Um, yeah, plasma glucose after an oil glucose load, more sensitive, but um, uh, a little bit um, issues with, with uh, how cumbersome the test is. Getting a random plasma glucose 200 or greater with symptoms of diabetes is another way to go. Now, the newest kit on the block is the A1C, um, so 6.5 or greater, which is, has the advantage of being able to be used without fasting samples, so it's attractive in that regard. Um, but as I as, um you can see here there are some caveats for the a, for using a1c and that's if you have an altered relationship between a1c and glycemia we really should be using the glucose measurements 
And it turns out that people with HIV do have a bit of an altered, uh, uh, there is an altered relationship between A1C and glycemia. So where A1C underestimates glycemia. So you can see here, um, it's a study that Colleen Hadigan did and Peter Kim, um, looking at people with and without HIV. Um, and, and you see a relationship between glucose and A1C as you would expect. But if you look at the HIV negative group, um, you can see that this, if, you, if you zoom in on say a, a A1C of, of 7.5 is equivalent to an, a, a glucose of around, an average glucose of around 150. If you look at that glucose of 150 in the people with HIV, it, it corresponds to an A1C of about 6.5. So here there's about a, a, a a full point, A1C point of underestimation. In the max, we found uh, more like a 0.2 to 0.5 um, difference, but it's something that we need to um, be thinking about, particularly um, with the diagnosis. There's some issues, of course, when you're when you're monitoring, uh, but but um, with the diagnosis, particularly people who are who are right around the diagnostic threshold. So for people with HIV, I go with a fasting glucose. You can do an oral glucose tolerance test if someone is in the pre-diabetes range. So I generally avoid the A1C for screening. So these are factors, uh, being on a back of ear, having a low CD4 cell count, being on protease inhibitors, having a high uh, corpuscular volume, um, is, uh, those are risk factors for increased discordance um, between glycemia and A1C. Uh, so, you know, really looking at, you know, we get the MCV as a freebie on our CBCs. So um, really anything greater than 90 um, femtoliters, there is a, a discordance. And certainly people who have a, a MCV greater than 100, the discordance is quite big. So the recommendation here is to screen people um, with, with fasting glucose. And here, they, this, this data might be a little bit, um, uh, you know, hasn't really changed in a long time regarding before antiretroviral therapy switching and then three months after and then annual results. Um, you know, we can do, you get fasting labs and we can do it, you know, at the same time as a lipid panel generally annually. So what do we do once diabetes is diagnosed? Um, lifestyle modification, of course, is the cornerstone. Um, so I'd like to talk more about that, but unfortunately I don't have time. So let's talk a little bit about drugs. The, the, um, the king of diabetes drugs, of course, is metformin. And really, if there's a, no contraindication, um, metformin should be the way to go. Um, and so here are the pros and cons regarding A1C lowering, long track record, no hypoglycemia when losing alone, used alone, no weight gain, actually some weight loss. There's some evidence of a CBD benefit um, and it's really cheap. Uh, so that's really important. And of course the GI side effects are rate limiting. So generally starting low dose and going slow, I generally increase by 500 uh, milligrams every week to get it up to a, a dose of, of 1000 BID. The contraindications are related to lactic, the potential risk for lactic acidosis, which is very, very rare, fortunately, um, but we need to be thinking about it uh, anyway. Note that um, the GFR recommendations um, have, have decreased. Um, so instead of 60, which it was for many, many years, we're down to 30, um, you know, we can use uh, it safely. The important thing is with, with you know, lots of people on Triamec, um, so uh, interact action with dalutegravir. So um, with concomitant dalutegravir, metformin levels are increased by about 80%. And so you don't want to go above 1,000 milligrams a day in people who are on concomitant uh, dalutegravir. So, um, so what about combination therapies? Um, and so this is where things get complicated because there are a lot of different choices. And so here are sort of the choices. So sulfonylureas, pioglitazone, insulin, incretins, and SGLT2 inhibitors. I'll go through each of these and talk a little bit about some of the newer drugs because they are pretty exciting. So sulfonylurea is tried and true, have decent A1C lowering, long track record, can be used, can have been shown to decrease microvascular events, very cheap. The problem, of course, is the weight gain that's associated with them, a high failure rate, and really the hypoglycemia can be a real problem because these will release insulin from beta cells no matter what the glucose is. Um, and so uh, there is a shift away from using sulfonylureas, there's no question. Um, uh, the, the, the real advantage here is the cost. So glitazones, very interesting drugs, lots of off-target effects, not used as much as, as they, um, they might, they could be. Um, 
they have good A1C lowering. They don't cause hypoglycemia when used alone. There's some evidence that they lead to cardiovascular benefit, some benefits metabolically, decreasing liver fat, um, improvements in lipids, low failure rate, um, have some effect on lipoatrophy, but probably not to, to be perceptible to, to the patient. They've gotten cheaper as, they, as, um, you know, as PIOs become generic. And the real issues are, are sort of these off-target effects regarding weight gain, which is some related to adipocyte differentiation and some related to fluid uh, retention. And so we want to avoid in people who have, have you know, HEF-PEF or HEF-REF, um, where it can provoke a heart failure episode other edema like macular edema, osteoporosis, and your bladder cancer or some other issues. Insulin, of course, has unlimited A1C lowering, at least theoretically, um, and can reduce microvascular events. At least trials that have used insulin have shown that. Though, of course, of course, the problem is that it's a narrow therapeutic window and, and um, hypoglycemia can be a real issue. Um, some issues with weight gain and Really, the one of the big issues now is cost, and and for reasons that are comp complicated, the costs have just skyrocketed for insulin, which has has made it um, uh, very difficult for people who are insulin dependent. So what I generally do with starting insulin in, in type two is just start with a, a long acting insulin at, at night, like uh, glargine or Detimer. You can use NPH, which is generally the cheapest. Start with a relatively low dose, and then increase by two or three units every two days, have the, the patient um, check their um, glucose and, and um, bring things down slowly. You can then add prandial insulin um, to, um, to, the, the, um, to the mix. Um, once you get people up, it's a way to introduce people. If you're pretty, you have some time, but you have to, you are pretty sure that the person's gonna need multiple injections. Sometimes, you know, 70, 30 has gotten a bad rap over the years, um, but it's a BID dosing. And for some of our patients, um, it's really, you can only get two doses in. Uh, so it, um, it, it, it's been a successful strategy in people who don't like to do in, injections. If the, if the A1C is very high, or if there's other, there's contraindications to some of the orals, or in people with hyper, severe hypertriglyceridemia, so above 1,000, for example, using insulin is the way to go. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the, they're not so new anymore, but newer drugs. And there's a lot of excitement around these drugs. Um, so the, 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 um, these drugs are collectively known as, as the incretins because they increase insulin secretion from the pancreas. So there's a hormone called GLP-1 that um, is released by, by L cells, which are um, endocrine cells in the gut, uh, in the, in the uh, distal small bowel and in the large intestines. GLP-1 is, is secreted um, when food is ingested. It has a few effects. One is to increase um, insulin secretion from beta cells in a glucose uh, dependent sort of way. Uh, the other is to decrease glucagon. It also slows gastric emptying and importantly has an essential effect on satiety. And so it has multiple effects. There are two strategies. One is to give an analog to GLP-1 um, and that, that's not broken down by normal mechanisms. The other is to give a medication that inhibits the enzyme that breaks down endogenous GLP-1 and that's called DPP-4. So these are DPP-4 inhibitors. So talking about GLP-1 receptor agonists, we have a whole bunch of drugs uh, in this class. So this is where, this is probably, you know, between GLP-1s and SGLT-2 inhibitors, which I'll talk about in a second, this is you know, the most exciting thing in diabetes, um, hands down in the last five years. So um, good A1C lowering, no hypoglycemia because of that glucose dependent insulin release from the pancreas. And the real benefit here is this a cardiovascular benefit, um, the weight loss effect from that central effect on satiety and decrease in, in liver fat. So really exciting um, results with, with the, the most common um, GLP-1. So this is semaglutide and dulaglutide that are used most often, generally given weekly administration, sub-Q injection, which people tend to like, pretty easy to administer, easy to use. You need to go start at a low dose and go up slowly, generally at month uh, increments. Um, but once you do that, it's actually pretty easy to use. Um, there is some issues with nausea. There's some uh, question about whether or not there's a uh, there's an increased risk of pancreatitis. So I tend to avoid them in pe in people who have had pancreatitis in the past. 
The issue, of course, is the cost, and they're, they're, they are super expensive. But because of these benefits that you see in the left-hand column, more and more insurers are covering these, at least uh, Doula or SEMA, generally not both, but one of them, including priority partners. So we can get these drugs for patients, and I think they're, they've um, been really effective. So just a real quick look into the future. I mentioned GLP-1 as an, as an incretin, but there's also other incretins, including a hormone called GIP. And so the look into the future is that there are dual incretin agonists. So this one, terzepatai, um, our ag it's an agonist to both GLP-1 and GIP. And this was a study that was in the New England Journal last year where um, people with diabetes um, were given either semaglutide at the, the, the maximum uh, diabetes dose. You can go higher than this for, for weight loss. But you can see these various doses are terzepatide. And you can see a, a decent difference, especially with 15 of terzepatide, a difference in, in A1C. Importantly, there's a difference in the effect on body weight. So all you know, both semaglutide and all the doses of terzepatide had important weight loss effects, but really significant weight loss effects in, um, in those at the highest dose of terzepatide, you know, compared to those semaglutide. So, you know, I think in five years, we're going to be seeing there have, you know, cardiovascular outcome trials for this going on, trials regarding um, hepatic steatosis, trials in obesity. So we're going to, in my I would think that in the next five years, we're going to see um, a real shift to another of these in, in um, focusing on these dual incretin agonists. So DPP-4 inhibitors, I mentioned, so this increases endogenous GLP-1. Um, decent drugs, but really sort of wimpy in terms of their A1C lowering, like a, a 0.5 A1C effect. So nice in someone who needs a little bit of glucose control, um, no hypoglycemia when used alone, weight neutral, doesn't have the same cardiovascular benefit as the GLP-1 uh, RA is still pretty expensive, but really easy to use. Side effects are pretty mild as well. So let's talk a little bit about SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are drugs that work in the kidney, so totally different mechanism. Um, you know, glucose is freely filtered in the glomerulus and the proximal kidney is reabsorbed through the SGLT2, SGLTs, um, and SGLT2 has a big effect. SGLT2, when it's inhibited, you end up peeing out glucose and that's how glucose is lowered. So no hypoglycemia when used alone. Some mild weight loss, not as much as you see with GLP-1 RAs, lowers blood pressure a little bit, but in yellow here is really the take home message. And that's, it does preserve kidney function. Even people without diabetes, it preserves kidney function. And the nephrologists are loving these drugs and decreasing heart failure risk in both HEFREF and HEFPEF. So um, again, another great uh, drug for, for uh, our cardiology colleagues as well. So used, you being used outside of, of people with diabetes. So these are important drugs um, you know, for these purposes, but also for glucose lowering, relatively le uh, more modest effects on A1C. Because you, the patient is urinating glucose, there's, there's a risk for UTIs and, um, and urinary candidiasis. This. Some people don't feel quite right, have some polyurian dehydration. There is a risk with DKA, so you generally avoid these drugs in patients with type uh, 1 diabetes, and they're pretty expensive. And then um, some studies have shown uh, risk of, of bone fractures and amputations, but this is a little controversial. So when you're thinking about, okay, with all these choices, what, how do we weigh the costs and the risks and the benefits? And so um, I, this is a complicated um, chart that um, you can take a look at in the standard of medical care. I'll break it down in a second. Uh, just wanna be mindful of the time here. Um, and so basically first line therapy with metformin, and then you, you stratify by indicators. There's on the left indicators of um, uh, cardiovascular disease, heart failure or CKD, and then other reasons. So let's focus on that first part here. And so basically if someone has, has these conditions or is at risk for these conditions, then we can, um, if they have cardiovascular disease, that's the, the one on the left or at high risk, the GLP-1 RA is, is, the, is the, way to, the way to go. Um, and maybe in, uh, with the G SGLT2 inhibitor. For heart failure, SGLT2 inhibitor, and this um, should also say uh, uh, HEF-PEF as well, because that trial just came out. And then patients who have uh, kidney disease um, with, with uh, microalbuminuria, um, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, are the way to go.
Now, other considerations, so minimizing hypoglycemia. So we have a bunch of drugs that, that um, don't have hypoglycemic effects when used not with, so the drugs that cause hypoglycemia, obviously insulin, but sulfonylureas, but um, BP4s, GLP-1-RAs, SGLT2 inhibitors, and TCDs don't cause hypoglycemia. So those could be used in combination after metformin. Weight loss, of course, is, is really important for many of our patients. And so the biggest effect, of course, is with the GLP-1 RAs and then later on with the twinkertins, as they're being called. Um, and um, cost, we talked about this a little bit. So um, our cheapest options are sulfonylureas and thiazolidinediones, so pioclidazone. So thinking about our glycemic targets, we tend to have this number sort of emblazoned in our brains that we wanna get everyone down to hemoglobin A1C of seven. Now in the last 10 years, really, there've been trials to look, okay, do we keep people at an A1C of you know, 7.5 or do we try to get them almost to normal? Um, and so there are a bunch of different studies that came out and with the idea that maybe we can re reduce the risk of, of complications, including car, uh, um, macrovascular disease complications, in particular MI, by normalizing the hemoglobin A1C. And so this is a meta-analysis that came out you know, some years ago, but I think is really instructive. There was, when you put these studies together, about a 10% risk reduction for cardiovascular disease with very intensive control versus conventional control. No benefit for cardiovascular mortality, so that's important. The, the kicker here is that there was a twofold increased risk of severe hypoglycemia. This is you know, um, needing, needing outside assistance um, with intensive control. And so um, it becomes a, a risk benefit uh, kind of thing. And so now um, based on these data, the ADA has really stressed the idea of individualization. So A1C7 is a decent target, but we can consider tighter control in people who are younger and healthier, you know, you can even normalize it, or looser control in people with, uh, who are older at more risk for hypoglycemia or have additional comorbidities. And so we don't really have to get to the, the one size fits all. Everyone has to get down to a hemoglobin A1C of seven, we try to get down below eight, um, but really there's not too much bang for your buck um, going from you know, a 7.5 to a 6.9 in terms of decreasing long-term risk. And it does open people up for having more hypoglycemic events. Um, so we need to be thinking about our patient individually and really what their A1C goal is. And with the caveat, then someone with HIV, where you have this discordance and underestimation of, of glycemia with A1C, you might want to uh, lower your A1C target uh, a little bit. So I just a couple slides. Um, and just to, and some of you are using um, CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, and most easily used is the Libre system. Um, so this is, you can see this person has a sensor on their arm that they change every two weeks. And you have a, a, a um, reader that you, you basically swipe over it and it gives you a, a um, instant measurement of glucose. And this people who are, are on multiple daily injections in particular, it's very useful for them to get to get these data. You know, people hate pricking their finger, and this really uh, improves quality of life uh, for people. And so, and now you can do it with you can um, do the reader with a smartphone too. And the other part of this, which is important, is that you can download the kind of the patient can can well, upload these data to a, a secure website. And so this is the report on one of my patients that I, I, I downloaded last night. And you can see that you know he's been using the um, the um, about 82% of the time it's it's been active. You can see the general trend. So he, uh, he does decently overnight. He has a big spike in the morning and then comes down you know, quite precipitously. And you can see the, the target range. You can look at the, his average glucose and his, his um, glucose management indicator, which is sort of a hemoglobin A1C equivalent. And then you can look more deeply um, at, at the glucose profiles and you can see that, you know, it pretty much follows, you know, he, he um, is a little high overnight, bounces up um, for breakfast and then, then goes down quite, quite a bit. And you can see general patterns over time and it's really useful. You can, you know, um, you can get this data at any time off, off the website and you can share screen with your, with your um, patient and sort of go over things really quite, quite easily with them. And you can see you need to swipe it every eight hours in order to get data. So for example, on the Saturday, uh, it didn't look like he swiped at all. 
And then some days you know, where there's a gap here that you probably didn't swipe uh, in the in the evening, so you do you do have a gap, and you can see where the, it is with low. So very useful to get people engaged. It's much easier than pricking fingers lots of times. Definitely for people who are multi multiple daily injections, this is this is definitely the way to go. Priority Partners covers it. You have to jump through some hoops, um, but definitely worth it. And this is, there's more and more data about um, the importance in terms of glycemic control. This was a study in Israel with 10 weeks of the of giving someone a Libre versus control. Um, people, both arms actually got better as you often see with diabetes studies, but this is the proportion of people who had more than a 0.5 A1C drop and then more than a 0.1 A1C drop. And you can see the difference between the Libre group versus the conventional use. You know, uh, so really helpful. And there's a quality of life data that people just, just love this, this modality. So thinking about other things to prevent complications, and I got to finish up here. So I'll, just to go through complications, and you can see them here, I won't spend too much time. Um, and then thinking about macrovascular complications and the ABCDs of trying to decrease cardiovascular risk. So um, life, uh, just to conclude, lifestyle changes are really critical. Um, metformin first, third and second drugs should be individualized. Uh, GLP-1 RAs to reduce those at risk for cardiovascular disease, SGLT-2, those with heart failure, CKD, um, individualization of, a, of A1C, and then taking a multi-prong approach. I just want to reiterate, um, I know that, that Nisa, Maruther, and Ness Mathodakis came to speak to you. This is a really important initiative that they are leading regarding both diabetes prevention and diabetes education. I'll focus on the education part of it, um, just a couple slides. Um, so this is big, it's diabetes self-monitoring. So this is using diabetes educators as real tools. So they were given a lot of money by the state of Maryland, this program to get an army of diabetes educators. And they've done a great job in recruiting them and training them. So you can see that you make a referral, you get an initial visit with a diabetes educator, um, and you can see with um, uh, uh, first visit and then up to 10 hours, and this is completely free and open to, to anyone. This is the ways, and you, if you just Google, you know, um, diabetes education, Hopkins, you'll get it. Specifically, if you put in REF20 into EPIC, it comes up with a referral. And so definitely all your patients with diabetes, I would definitely recommend that they, that they get onto this um, self-monitor training. I think it's a, a really key tool. And so I will end there. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brown. That was amazing. And the slides will be available. So I'm sure many of us were furiously writing things down, but they also will be available. There's a few questions for you in the chat. Do you think you could try to look at them in the chat while Ian gets started? Yeah, yeah no problem. Yep. That would be awesome. Yeah, and, thank you um, so much. And feel free to reach out to me, you know, with uh, separate questions um, if, uh, or keep writing in the chat. That's fine too. Thank you so much. Um, and so now without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Cook, who's one of our amazing pharmacists, who's gonna tell us about the antiretroviral therapy pipeline. Um, and Ian, you can go ahead and, and share your screen. And I will stay unmuted to let you know that you're showing the right thing. That would be helpful. <laughs> uh... Are you seeing the right? Yep, it okay. looks great. <laughs> Not seeing my notes. <laughs> no, no, those are hidden. All right, thank you um, and good afternoon. And I'm here to present today on one of my favorite topics in HIV medicine, that's our treatment pipeline. So for anyone I haven't met, my name is Ian Cook and I'm the pharmacy operations coordinator for the Bartlett Pharmacy. Before we jump into the conversation today, um, I have two disclosures. The first is that I have received consulting fees from GSK slash Vive Healthcare. And this presentation is a pipeline presentation. So everything we talk about today is off-label and non-FDA approved potential therapies. So today we're gonna look at the HIV treatment pipeline as a whole, and then really jump in and look at the potential places in therapy for both lenacapavir and Islatravir. So when we look at our HIV treatment pipeline, we obviously have a lot of options for our patients. Um, some of these probably we haven't seen in a little bit, but the question always comes up, why do we need even more options? 
some of the um, more traditional answers that come up and drive drug development are to decrease pill burden for our patients, to eliminate side effects from the medications, increase convenience for our patients, to eliminate or minimize drug interactions, to decrease the frequency that they have to take tablets, to provide them with a higher barrier for resistance, to create more tolerable formulations for patients, and then to overcome resistance that patients have developed. As we look at our current HIV treatment pipeline, there's a couple themes that kind of stand out. The first one that I've noticed is um, highly treatment experienced patients are really in focus in our treatment pipeline. And we have a lot of new options that are coming out to help those patients that have been living with this disease for decades now and have developed resistance over that time. Also customization. We're really at a point now where we're not having to switch patients' regimens just because of resistance or something with a higher barrier comes out. We're really able to now start to be able to tweak those regimens to our patients and to their needs and their lifestyles and what works best for them. And then finally, the future is definitely long acting. As we look at the treatment pipeline coming up, we're really starting to utilize technologies from other disease states to look at how we can decrease the dosing frequency for our patients and provide them finally with some long acting options. Some of the current long acting technologies that are already available that we're looking at repurposing for the treatment of HIV include implants and long acting injections. Some of the more experimental ones are long acting oral formulations patients can take, as well as uh, one that I find interesting is the microarray patch where patients would be able to um, receive medication through a dermal patch. This slide is just a snapshot of everything in the treatment pipeline um, currently under development. There's no one-stop shop, unfortunately, for everything that's coming. Um, but this is going through a multitude of resources, it's kind of everything I found that's out there. This snapshot doesn't include anything that is being developed solely for the for in the prep space, and it also doesn't include any formulation changes. So there's a handful of medications that are currently FDA approved that are under investigation as different um, routes of administration, whether that be injectable or long acting. What's really exciting, not only do we have all these potential options to really help customize our patients' treatment plans, but we're also finally getting new classes and new agents in those. So monoclonal antibodies, capsid inhibitors, maturation inhibitors, and NRTTIs are all potential new classes that could help us. For this conversation, I really wanna jump into lenacapavir and Izlachivir since they are two of the ones that are farthest, aligned, farthest along in the developmental pipeline. So lenacapavir will be our first in class capsid inhibitor if approved. And it works by modulating the stability and our transportation of capsid complexes and shows no cross resistance with any current treatment options. Because it affects capsid, it's affecting multiple stages of the HIV life cycle, including nuclear transport, virus assembly and release, and capsid assembly. I'm a very visual learner, so I love this slide. Um, it shows the three parts of the HIV pipeline marked in red are showing the three stages that are disrupted by lenacapavir. So lenacapavir binds to that capsid core in the cytoplasm before nuclear transport, and it blocks the transport of the capsid into the nucleus via that nuclear pore complex and prevents integration. If integration does occur, lenacapavir binds to the precursor polyproteins before the immature virion is formed. And this causes a destabilization of those polyproteins and decreases virus production. Finally, during maturation, lenacapavir disrupts propsic capsid assembly of that cone-shaped core. Because it doesn't form that cone shape and it forms another shape, the virus that's resulted is not infective. I did wanna point out on this graphic, the part that I highlighted in the purple box, um, previously, there had been some debate on where exactly reverse transcriptase occurs and did it occur in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. And at Croy last year in 2021, there were multiple studies that really definitively proved that the core stays together into the nucleus and disassembles there. So this is an updated graphic if you've seen um, ones in previous um, talks that have it in the cytoplasm. So lenacapavir is a set of two subcutaneous injections that are currently given in the abdominal region. They're administered every six months after an oral loading dose. 
The loading dose is at the bottom of the slide for your reference. And this loading dose is required for kinetics. It's not just purely a safety or a loading dose like we have in Cabanuva that you have the potential to skip. And lenacapavir is not monotherapy. I think we've seen enough studies from around the world showing us that monotherapy is not a great option for patients. Um, so it does need to be given in combination with um, an optimized background regimen. The Capella trial is one of the first trials um, to really look at lenacapavir in patients. And it involved highly treatment experienced patients with viral loads greater than or equal to 400. The patients had to have resistance to two or more agents from three of four main classes, and they had to have two or less fully active agents from the four main classes. For this trial, a viral load was done at screening and then at baseline. If there was a decline in that viral load between the two screenings, the patients were assessed as having a adherence problem, and that was probably what was causing their viral load and resistance. Those patients were included in that bottom line, that non-randomized cohort. Since they were highly treatment experienced, they didn't have a lot of options. They didn't want to withhold a potential therapy. Patients that didn't have that decrease in viral load between the two screenings were continued into the randomized cohort. The first part of the randomized cohort was that 14 days of functional monotherapy that's required to the, by the FDA um, to prove potency of, new any, of, new, of any new antiretroviral. From there, they went into the maintenance phase of lenacapavir combined with an optimized background regimen. Of note, when the patients started this, six of the patients had nothing in their optimized background regimen that was really active. 14 patients had one other drug and 16 patients had two other drugs that was combined with. So I'm really excited to provide this data to us today, the Capella 52-week trial data. This came out just last weekend at CROI this year. So um, at IAS last summer, 26-week data was presented that you'll see on the left side of your screen. Um, but we now have the full year data. The light purple is the percentage of patients that were virally suppressed at less than or equal to 50. And then the dark purple is virally suppressed less than or equal to 200. So at week 26, 81% of patients were suppressed to less than 50. And then at 52 weeks, that climbed to 83. For comparison, that the same 26 week time period, Fostemsevir in the BRIGHT trials had 53% of patients suppressed to less than 50, and abulizumab had 43%. So this is an increase from both of those trials. Four patients during the first 26 weeks did develop resistance to lenacapavir. When they went through and looked at um, drug levels, two of those patients had, it seemed, had just stopped taking their oral background regimens, and two of those patients had no active agents in their oral background regimens. So all four patients that did develop resistance during the first 26 weeks were on effectively monotherapy. When they looked at adverse events, they pulled out the injection site reactions separately. So when we look at non-injection site reactions, nausea and diarrhea were the most common, least seen side effects. As far as injection site reactions, the pain, um, sorry, swelling, erythema, and the nodule all decreased between the two injections. The injections are given six months apart. So in a 52 week trial, the patients only received two of them. Pain was the only one that stayed pretty consistent between the injections. So um, it'll be interesting to see as this trial continues if that number decreases like we saw in the Cabanuva trials. Of note, the nodule they're talking about there, um, patients have described it as if you push down on palpate the area where the injections were given, they can kind of feel a little nodule or a little ball. These are not visible, they're not painful, you would really have to palpate for them, and they're nothing like the nodules we see with T20. So based on the data from the Capella trial, the FDA is currently reviewing um, lenacapavir as a treatment option for highly treatment experienced patients, and we are expecting a decision on its um, approval later this month. Also ongoing is the Calibrate study, and this is involving treatment-naive patients, and it's looking at injectable lenacapavir in combination with other oral agents. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this trial um, continues and what comes of it since it was it was paired with um, both Discovy, Vimleti, and a dose of Bictiglavir that's not currently available by itself. 
So not sure what that'll look like um, at the end of the trial. And then it's currently being evaluated as a potential option for PrEP also. So this brings us to our second um, drug to talk about today, and that's Islatravir. Islatravir, you might see in the literature, is MK8591 or EFDA. It's a first-in-class nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or NRTTI, that has a dual mechanism of action. It inhibits translocation and causes delayed chain termination. So Islatravir prevents the opening of the reverse transcriptase nucleotide binding site and doesn't allow nucleotides to be incorporated into the viral DNA. Islatravir also changes the viral DNA structure that, and prevents nucleotide incorporation, but it doesn't work in the reverse transcriptase active site, and this prevents it from being susceptible to resistance-conferring mutations. One of my favorite parts about Islatravir is its metabolism. So Islatravir enters the cell as is Lachavir in the purple. It's rapidly converted in the cytoplasm to Islatravir triphosphate or ISLTP in that light purple color, which is its active form. Islatravir TP has a long half-life, about 191 hours. And while it's in the cell, it's slowly metabolized back to the Islatravir. And from there, Islatravir exits the cell in a form that can be taken up by another cell, recycled, and so on and so forth. One of the first combinations is Latravir was looked at in, it was in combination with Duravarine. And this trial was a dose finding study that resulted um, in the Latravir 0.75 milligram dose combined with Duravarine 100 milligram dose daily as the optimal dose. This was completed in treatment naive patients. And on the screen is both the 96 weeks FDA snapshot analysis and the 144 from this trial. When you look at the graphs, the kind of mint green bar that's second from the left is that 0.75 milligram dose of Islatravir. At 96 weeks, 90% um, of patients were virally suppressed less than 50, and that did drop to 83 um, at, one, at 144 weeks. Of note, the number of patients, percentage of patients that had no virologic data in the window did double between the two snapshots. And it's not clear um, if this was a result of the pandemic, since these the 144-week results were presented last year at the European AIDS Conference. So this trial was going on during the pandemic, and we know that does have some effect. As far as adverse events, um, diarrhea and I mean, sorry, nausea and headache were the most commonly seen. These groups were very small. There's about 30 patients in arm. So we'll wait to see what the full side effect profile looks like as they expand the trials. So based on that trial, um, the portfolio of trials called the Illuminate Studies was created. And this is looking at that daily oral dose of Islatravir 0.75 milligrams combined with Duravarine 100 milligrams. It is a single tablet um, regimen. And the Illuminate trials are looking at a whole host of patient populations, including highly treatment experienced patients, virologically suppressed patients, treatment naive patients, and adolescents. The adolescent trials will include both treatment naive and virologically suppressed adolescents. At the same time that trial was going on, Islatravir was also being looked at in combination um, with an investigational medication called MK8507. 8507 is an investigational NNRTI that has been described as a long-acting version of Duravarine. These two were combined in a trial called the IMAGINE-DR trial. It was a switch trial that involved patients that were virologically suppressed on Bictarvi before starting. Um, patients received a once-weekly oral treatment of Islatravir and MK8507. During this trial, it was a dose finding, so the dose of Islatravir was stable at 20 milligrams a week, and then the, or the MK8507 dose did change, and the patients received either 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, or 400 milligrams. Unfortunately, this study was stopped early by their external data monitoring safety board. So the external data monitoring safety board found a substantial decrease in lymphocytes and CD4 positive T cells from baseline in the Islatravir plus 8507 treatment arms at both 12 and 24 weeks. Below in the chart is the only data we really have from this stoppage so far. 
they reported the, the mean percent change from baseline at week 24. The doses across the top are the doses of 8507 that were combined with that stable 20 milligram dose of Islatravir. When this study was originally paused, it was really attributed, it was attributed to the effects of 8507 causing this and because it hadn't been seen in any of the other Islatravir trials. So all we know currently from this pause, like I said, is these percentage changes. We don't know the actual lab value changes or the ranges. The only description of these changes from the company are both parameters stayed within normal limits and no opportunistic infections were reported in these patients. As part of this safety pause, they did go back through and look at the entire portfolio of his Lachevere trials, including other trials that weren't that were looking at higher doses and less frequent dosing options, as well as PrEP trials that were beginning. And they did see a decrease in both T4, CD4 positive T cells and total lymphocytes in any other Islachivir doses that were higher. And they described a higher dose as anything over that low dose daily 0.75 milligrams. So because of this, Islachivir trials currently worldwide are paused. If patients were on a daily dose of Islachivir, in the trial, they were given the option to continue or switch. They either switched back to their previous regimen or an appropriate regimen. Patients that were in trials involving Islatravir and these extended dosing intervals, like weekly dosing, were switched back also to either their previous regimen or a comparable regimen. And safety monitoring for all patients has been increased. Currently, the focus is to figure out what are these interactions, what about is Lachevere is causing this change, and why, when it is combined with 8705, is this changed enhanced. Um, all of these pauses in this data really came out in November and December, so there, I haven't seen anything from this past weekend at Croy really looking into this, but it's so new that's not surprising. We're hoping later this year um, to have more information and really understand more about what's going on so that we can deter so that it can be determined if this is a potential option still for our patients. So early or about a year ago, um, the manufacturers of both is Latravir and Lenac Habavir announced a joint development project looking at creating a two drug long acting regimen containing both is Latravir and Lenac Habavir. And they're looking at both long acting oral and injection injectable options. And last fall, they did start recruiting for a phase two trial in virologically suppressed patients, looking at a once weekly oral combination of both of these. That combination does require an oral loading dose of lenacapavir on days one and two. That loading dose is very different from the loading dose used in the injectable um, Capella trial. Currently, this trial is paused as part of that global Zlatravir, um pause. And then also under development, depending on what determines with those Latravir, they're looking at an every three month dosing, dosing option for this two drug regimen. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Ian, that was wonderful. I think there have been a few questions in the chat. Um, let's see. I'm going to go back. Right. I, I think I you, got, you got had a question. I had one question. It was a little bit disturbing that people had nausea and diarrhea with um, the Capella trial. And I was just wondering, was that like for the whole six months? Um, that I'm not sure about. I can look and find out and get back to you. Um, I don't know that they gave a time frame for how long they lasted. But I will definitely go back and look at some of also the new data from last weekend um, and see if there was an answer and let you know. I think our patients would probably ask that question if we said that you'll get it and they get their such a not very often injection. Yeah. And then there's a question from um, Amita Gupta about whether there's any incidents, uh, insights into the reduced uh, CD4 and lymphocytes and, and also a great talk, but um, <laughs> Do you um, have any? So I did request information and that is the um, data presented was really it. Um, the only other information that they released was percentage changes in their um, early stage prep trials. Um, they actually saw in the 
prep trials had a bigger change, a decrease, um, but they described it as being le the numerical values were less than what was seen in their other trials. Um, but without values, we really can't determine or make a good assumption. Um, they don't seem, when I asked for um, data from them, there really was not an answer. And this is kind of their focus. Um, they said that it's their focus and that it had just happened in like November, December. So this is, they're, they're digging in, they're hoping to give us an update later this year. So, and I can just add to that from the, um, I, not a financial conflict, but I have a, a good friend who's one of the people who's doing the Asatravir program. And I don't have any insights because she didn't actually know, but um, they're working very hard to try and figure out what is causing this because I think many people were very excited for the potential of this agent in a number of different settings, including with contraception and other longer acting formulations. But there is some hope that it may be dose dependent, at least in the PrEP setting, and that some of the PrEP dosing, they were really trying to push to extend the interval. And I think there's some hope that maybe it will be dose dependent and lower doses will be useful, but I don't have any numbers. They did, um, that was a good point. They did bring up when I had a conversation with them that it seems to be it very dose dependent and that their doses they described as aggressive. <laughs> um, they thought there was some more wiggle room. Um, so maybe that'll help decrease it too, but we'll, more to come, I'm sure. Yeah, and I think there, in terms of mechanism, there is that paper from last year showing that NNRTIs of some types um, can lead to apoptosis of, of um, CD4 cells and that was published in science last year, but that doesn't explain the PrEP data. Because I think in theory, if it was only causing loss of cells that actually had integrated HIV, then the cure field would get super excited. But I, I don't, the PrEP data unfortunately undermines that as a potential explanation. Um, any additional questions? Well, this is uh, amazing from both of you. And uh, for those of you who've been watching the chat, uh, Dr. Brown has been answering lots of very specific queries and I'll probably publicly ask you right now if we could have you come back to do a, a case discussion session where we sort of Absolutely. put together some questions, maybe in a couple of months we can uh, impose on you again. Definitely. And thank you so much, Ian, for that is really helpful insights into what's coming down the line. And because as much as we have wonderful things, um, we need more options in a couple of different ways. Okay, great. Well, thanks to both of you. And Dr. Brown did offer to answer more questions. So I think if anyone needs his email, let me know. It's a longer one. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great session, Eileen.